So polymers are really kind of like, we, uh, sometimes we call them plastics, really are part of our daily lives in all sorts of different ways. Um, plexiglass, which we've now is being used a lot, um, that's made from a polymethacrylate. So this is from a radical polymerization. It could be from radical polymerization. There would be a pi bond right there, and then poly polymerize that. Um, polymethacrylate, um, inks and varnishes. So you can see, right, notice there's just one carbon difference, right? That makes all of a sudden from plexiglass to, to inks and varnishes, right? So these, these small structural changes in polymers, right? So because you have, even though the monomers aren't that different, right, just a methyl difference, but when you have a thousand of them, that one little difference can make, can all of a sudden that, that structural difference can change the function a lot, right? That can kind of come out. Change to a carboxylic acid, right? Thickening, adhesives, right? So just, again, turn that from an ester to an acid changes the physical properties, right? Even though the monomer hasn't changed that much, but because there's so many monomers in a polymer, that makes a difference, as does how the molecular weight, right? So a polymer with 1,000 monomers versus 10,000 is going to have very different Physical properties, as you can imagine. Ethylene oxide, right? Water soluble packing film. Put a carbon there, all of a sudden it becomes a lubricant, right? Ethylene oxide, right? Appliances, housing, electronics, like all sorts of different things, right? Again, I always think it's fascinating to me that as you just small chemistry molecular changes can give you very different physical properties. That's always interesting to me. Polycaprolactone, biodegradable sutures. Right? So everybody's ever had uh, stitches? Those, those things dissolve. Those are polymers. That's why that, that's that happened. Polylactic acid, biodegradable packing. Probably said you've seen PLA cups, different things like that. Like, so a lot of these polymers, some trying, they're trying to make polymers that are biodegradable. Right? We're trying to make so that we can have, a, have something, have it work, and then you know, break it back down and reuse it for something else. A lot of these monomers, we're trying to get monomers that come from natural sources but not but sustainable natural sources, so not from oil, not from uh, natural gas, and those kind of things. A lot, of, a lot of chemistry chemicals come from that, so we're trying to find some more sustainable sources. Um, so try to make these things. So I show one example here: um, bisphot, like bisphenol A, right? And you guys have heard of bisphenol A probably. And there's phosgene, that's mustard gas, right? So there's some things that happen when we, like when we do these polymerizations that maybe aren't the greenest way to do things, so like kind of the reimagining of these things, but obviously to make really important materials, right? We need these materials. So rethinking about maybe the starting materials or creating new materials with new starting materials that get the same function, that's important. Other couple ones have some isocyanates. These make polyurethanes that you probably have heard of as well. Um, so again, though, some of these star materials aren't the greatest, right? So chemistry can come in and say, let's reimagine maybe even new polymers or how to make the ones that we know are really well, work really well. Or how do we break down some of these things with chemistry to get back to those uh, high, high costs or, you know, or maybe not environmentally safe things. How do we take care of these things, right? So chemistry needs to think about that. That's what chemistry can do. All right, so for this last bit, um, we talked about you know, the types of polymers and kind of looked at some different examples, what they're used for. Now let's talk about some physical properties of polymers. And these two terms are new. Uh, melt and glass transition temperature. So TM is for melt transition temperature and TG is for the glass transition temperature. And these are two important kind of different terms than we see with a small molecule. So a TM is the temperature at which the polymer becomes more like a liquid and flows. It's not really a melting point, but it's when it becomes more like, more like a liquid and much more like flowy um, type material. So you can see as the TM, you can get different properties, different TMs. That's when the polymer would uh, become more of a liquid. Now TG is the glass transition temperature. Now this is a little different. TG is when the polymer becomes above that temperature, the polymer is flexible. So it's much more malleable and flexible. So some things to consider, these are two things to consider when you design your polymer, right? And as you change different physical properties or the size of your polymer, uh, you will get different TMs and TGs. Um, so for instance, if you wanna hold coffee, like really hot liquid, you wanna make sure your TM is pretty high. Otherwise that would make the cup 
literally melt. Also, maybe your TG, you want your TG to be pretty high too because you don't want the all of a sudden your cup to just become a flowy liquid or to flow either and fall apart. Um, another thing to think about, say if you're in winter sports, you want your TG uh, to be above zero um, because you can think about at if you're playing if you're in the winter and it's cold, right? You don't want something uh, to become super brittle in cold temperatures and maybe break apart. Like think of like snowboard, you want to have or skis, you want to have a little bit of flex to them, so you want to have the TG. Uh, high enough so that your uh, winter sports equipment would just break apart as well. So these are kind of interesting different ways to think about things and these can be greatly influenced by both the size of the polymer and the uh, polymer structure as well.